A very good evening and welcome to this second part of Weekend Prime. Now, today we discuss the other aspect of cancer care. Most of the time when people talk about cancer, they talk about chemotherapy, radiotherapy, uh, hormonal therapy, surgery, any other forms of the active management of cancer. But tonight we'll be discussing palliative and hospice care, which is the other aspect to supporting cancer patients. And with me in studio today to discuss this subject is... Dr. Andrew Diambo. Dr. Andrew Diambo is the Assistant Lecturer in Internal Medicine, uh, Medical Oncology and Hematology at the University of Nairobi Department of Clinical Medicine and Therapeutics. He is also an honorary consultant at the Kenyatta National Hospital and is the clinical lead consultant at the, at the Nairobi Radiotherapy and Cancer Center. Also with me is uh, Dr. Zipora Ali. Dr. Ali is the Executive Director of Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association. She also serves on the board of several organizations, including the International Hospice and Palliative Care Association. And to start this discussion, I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Ali. When people talk about palliative care, hospice care, what exactly do you mean by this? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll thank you first of all for inviting us. <laughs> I'll start maybe with uh, what palliative care means in a layman's language. Um, palliative care is by the definition of WHO is care that is given, WHO is World Health Organization, mm -hmm. is uh, a care that is given to people with life-threatening life illnesses. Um, and by life-threatening illnesses, I mean uh, diseases like cancer, advanced uh, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, heart diseases, HIV, sickle cell, and also other illnesses that are found in children which may be congenital. So really it focuses on the quality of life of these patients, uh, their day-to-day -day living, how they're living their day, uh, by looking at things like their physical um, needs. For example, cancer patients have a lot of pain that needs to be well assessed and treated with very um, strong pain medications sometimes. And they might have other symptoms uh, with the disease. They might have a cough, they might have a, a, a diarrhea, they might have constipation, they might have breath, uh, difficulty in breathing. Mm -hmm. So all these symptoms are taken care by palliative care uh, clinicians. At the same time, uh, they also, we, we also focus on the other needs of the patient. It's not only physical, but suffering is, is really holistic. There's the emotional part of it, there's the uh, spiritual part of it, when you ask yourself, why me? When you start asking God, what did I do? There's the psychological aspect of it. There's the, also the financial part of it. So palliative care will try to focus on all these uh, aspects of care, which we call total pain. Mm -hmm. And also, it also supports the family of the patient because they become, become very distressed when they have a, a very sick patient in the family. And also, uh, when the patient, if the patient should die, some, not every patient dies, some are undergoing treatment for mm -hmm. cure, but if the patient should die, palliative care will also uh, extend to... Uh, uh, supporting the family that is bereaved during their bereavement. So it's really, uh, it's, it's really uh, focusing on quality of life, mm -hmm. not just of the patient, but of the family as well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Odiembo, as a practicing oncologist, when do you decide to start a patient on palliative care? Is it after the active treatment of cancer or do you start from the diagnosis of the disease? Thank you very much, Marcy, for inviting me as well. And <coughs> I agree with uh, Zipporah. Um, palliative care needs to start right from the beginning, right from the time you make the diagnosis of this cancer, because as Zipporah has clearly said, we are trying to address the symptoms that accompany this disease. And as much as we may be trying to treat the disease, maybe actively with chemotherapy, for example, we need to address these palliative care needs from the onset of the diagnosis. Um, <clears throat> as patients become more ill, and sometimes um, cancers can become overwhelming, and it reaches a point where um, we switch off active treatment and we focus more on what we call end-of-life care um, to really support the patient through this difficult moment and really add quality to the time left rather than trying to be so aggressive with treatment. And that particular period is usually a very sensitive period. I believe if, um, if you educate the patient and the patient's caregivers and relatives about your goals of care, then it becomes uh, something that's achievable. And I think palliative care is something that begins right from the diagnosis all the way until the end. It has different stages, and it depends on how you walk the journey with a particular patient. But does it really happen in our setting where, from the diagnosis, a patient is introduced into palliative care and hospice care? Dr. Ali, I can see you <laughs> shaking your no. head. <laughs> no, I, I really I would like to answer that. He might say yes because he's an oncologist, I'm a oncologist. But I just want to say that a lot of times, 
we see the patients towards end of life. Mm -hmm. uh, the doctors need to really be a lot more, the clinicians need to be more sensitive about this issue because I think it's the issue of that uh, if you send a patient for palliative care, it's like you're giving up on the patient. It's the wrong conception, it's the wrong misconception you, because it's not at end of life. Mm -hmm. It's from the time you make a diagnosis. And for the, the clinician who works alongside with the palliative care team will actually see the <coughs> quality that they're bringing into the patient's life. They will see the value of it. Even their work becomes easier because the symptoms of these patients are, are, are controlled. And then the psychologist part, most doctors, um, most oncologists do not have time to sit with the patient and do counseling. Mm. That psychological, psychological issue, the psychological, the spiritual, the emotional part of it is really uh, emphasized in, with, by the palliative care team. They take their time to address this issue. I think we need to sensitize our clinicians to understand that we are part of the team and that we should focus on working together. In fact, I'm happy to say that the National Cancer Control uh, program that mm -hmm. was launched this year mm -hmm. has put this all together. Mm -hmm. It's emphasizing on the teamwork, on working together from the beginning to whatever the end is. Mm -hmm. So we need really to change how we practice. Mm -hmm. And even the community need to change how they perceive what palliative care is. And mm -hmm. you know, so it's not just when a patient is dying, then you take them to that place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Odiamba, why, why is it then not a common practice for doctors, for oncologists to introduce patients to palliative care from the point of diagnosis? I think uh, um, Dr. Zipora has mentioned a, a real concern. It's something that um, needs time to be invested. And I try to do it as much as possible. And when you're discussing a diagnosis with a patient, you need to be very clear as to what are the goals of treatment and what we are trying to achieve. Okay. Um, many at times when cancers are um, quite disseminated or they are quite uh, advanced, we need to discuss the goals of care with these patients and we introduce that palliative aspect at that point. At our center, we work hand in hand with uh, palliative care nurses who have received training in that area and they take time to sit with these patients and explain to them what the doctor is trying to do and what we are trying to aim at. And at every stage, you know, it's not, it's not one in all, mm -hmm. it's a process that keeps changing as we move along because also goals can change mm -hmm. and diseases behave differently at certain stages. So it's really a journey that you have to walk together with the patient, the patient's relatives and caregivers all the way from the diagnosis mm -hmm. towards the, the tail end of the care. Okay. You mentioned one of the misconceptions on uh, palliative <coughs> care and being an African society, our upbringing or how we are socialized with our cultures mm -hmm. have really put death as almost a taboo. Mm -hmm. People hardly discuss death or end of life issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we bring about mm -hmm. issues of palliative care and hospice care, mm -hmm. then the misconception, as you said, is that, okay, we are discussing death and you know that mm -hmm. this person is at the end of life. Mm -hmm. How then do you overcome this uh, cultural and social challenges? Yes, that is a very big challenge for uh, for us. I think we, we don't really openly talk about death like the Western culture does. And um, in fact, most of the times, for example, if, a, if an elderly patient is sick, somebody brings in their mother or their father, and they tell you, don't tell them they're sick. Don't tell them they've got cancer. Don't, don't tell them they're dying. Because if they think if you tell them that, they're going to die. They're going to give up on life. Yet the person understands their own body. They know what's going on. They'll actually when the, the family is not there, they'll actually ask you, am I dying? Or they'll want to talk about it. We need to openly talk about death and dying. I mean, we, we know that everybody has to die. We will all die. It's something, we're not, we're not immortal, we're not run away from death. But we need to, to be sensitized to be able to talk about it. Some countries actually have what they call death cafes. And it's not, you know, the way they just go and discuss issues about dying because it, it's, it's, part of our, our, it's part of the journey of life. Mm -hmm. So we need to really do a lot of advocacy um, and talk about death and dying and be able to, because if a person is prepared for their death, they actually go away in a, you know, we actually call it a good death because they make up, uh, they make up with the family members they have, they have, you know, they have not been talking to. They write their wills. They do the unfinished businesses. They prepare themselves. They make peace with their maker. They prepare for themselves for God. We deny people this when we don't talk to them about dying. So we need to actually open up as a society and talk about death. We see death every day in this country. It doesn't have come to come from a, a terminal illness. We have just seen that uh, six kids, have, as soon as I've been killed, and a watchman, death is there. We need to be able to talk about mm -hmm. death as a society. Okay. And uh, talking about palliative care and preparing for death and mm -hmm. for one to meet their makeup, yeah. uh, when it comes to religion, is there a different approach with the different religious uh, beliefs that somebody has? For example, does Islam handle palliative care 
and end of life issues differently from Christianity, for example? Well, that's difficult to, um, to, to answer, but I can maybe speak from my experiences. When I would visit Muslim patients, I actually found they were more prepared for death mm. because you would find that there's a community in the house, they are, they are reading the Quran, they are saying the prayers, they are burning the incense, they are preparing for this patient's death. Mm -hmm. When you visit a Christian family, there's also a lot of going, a lot going on. They're they are singing and everything, but it's more of healing, praying for healing, and yet you're seeing this patient is gasping. Mm. I mean, the next few minutes, this patient is going to you know, stop breathing. So I, I think that, that it's, it's different ways where how we approach our death. We just need to understand that death is part of life. Mm. Yeah, and and, that's, and even now we are introducing a, a spiritual training, a spirituality and palliative care, mm -hmm. introducing a training in this country where we want to train those to support patients spiritually to be able to face these things mm -hmm. and, and, and deal with them appropriately. Mm. Uh, Dr. Odiambo, what have you seen from your experiences when I it think, comes to um, religious uh, I, I agree. of terminal illness? I, I agree fully with uh, Dr. Ali. It's different with different religions and I agree um, amongst the Islam community they usually seem to be more prepared uh, when it comes to that time but all in all I think um, if you take your time as the doctor to really sit down with the main family members the next of kin and you explain to them first of all how the patient got to that stage people want to understand why and if you give them a rational explanation that this type of cancer um, is a rare cancer, for example, and it affects this type of people, and when it gets to this point, this is what we do. And once they understand the journey that probably the patient has undergone up to that point, mm -hmm. and probably what is expected afterwards, then they accept such news better. Mm -hmm. When you tell them that you have tried this and this and this, and these are the options of treatment that we have tried, these ones may be dangerous, these ones might be helpful, but looking at the whole situation, we have done our best. The acceptance is, is, is taken up uh, better and patients accept this and you can be able to prepare them um, for death. It's very difficult with young patients and teenagers and young adults because this is somebody who's at the prime of their life. You know, maybe a couple has just gotten married and then they get a cancer diagnosis and it's a very serious one. That requires hours and hours of counseling and talking to them with the palliative care nurses, several sessions until they understand that this is exactly what is happening. Okay. Yeah. And, okay, we focused more on cancer, but then palliative care also includes the other terminal illnesses. Mm -hmm. So I want to, to, to <coughs> talk about pain. 80% of patients with the diagnosis of cancer or HIV and AIDS, for example, are said to be experiencing pain most of the time. Yet the International Narcotics Control Board in 2010 uh, from a report said that uh, the use of opioids in some of these countries, uh, the low and middle income countries, was either inadequate or very inadequate, meaning opioids are not really used that much. Mm -hmm. And opioids here means the, the likes of morphine, yet these people require a morphine. Where is the challenge? Are there our healthcare providers are not giving these opioids, which is one of the drug of choice for people suffering from cancer? What is the problem? Okay, I'll answer that because right now we have a program on access to opioids that is being supported by um, our organization and American Cancer Society, Open Society Foundations, and the Ministry of Health and KNH. We actually have morphine in this country, oral morphine, mm -hmm. that we use for pain, uh, for pain control in cancer patients and other illnesses. But we see a lot of patients still suffering from pain. We don't have enough demand from, um, from the doctors, the clinicians who, are, who should be prescribing. And this is maybe because of lack of knowledge or maybe because of um, myths and misconceptions surrounding the use of morphine and also because of the laws um, you know, our narcotic, uh, our, our 1964 narcotic act that's being reviewed right now says that uh, if a patient prescribes opioid in the wrong way, uh, I mean, a doctor prescribes in the wrong way, uh, they will go to jail, they will be fined one million Kenyan shillings. So there are all these barriers that make doctors not want to prescribe opioids. And many regulations that if you have to prescribe, you have to write on three prescriptions, you have to do this and that. Those are some of the barriers. But I want to say that, um, okay, 80% of the morphine is consumed by America, Canada, and Australia. Yet we have 80% of the patients needing these drugs in Africa, Asia, and other low-income countries. So there's that imbalance. But I also want to say that 
for, as Kenya, we are actually doing a lot in terms of access to opioids. Like I said, we are working on this project where the government actually has brought in morphine, has brought in morphine into the country. For the first time, they are bringing in powder morphine, which is being constituted at Kenyatta National Hospital, and from there it's supposed to go to Kenya Medical Supply um, Agency, KEMSA, who are supposed now to uh, supply it to the county hospitals as mm -hmm. per demand. Mm -hmm. The demand is the problem. The demand is law. Okay. The demand is low because mm -hmm. doctors are not prescribing. So I want to come directly <laughs> to Dr. So thank you, thank you I, for we, attacking me on that. But, yes. um, and before you say, you know, this issue of pain and people who are not supposed to die in pain when yeah. there's medication, yet doctors are not prescribing mm -hmm. pain. It's, it's a human rights issue. It is a human rights yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. so, so why, why I, are doctors not prescribing? I agree. Not, uh, <laughs> okay, um, let me say this. A patient should not be in pain. And as a doctor, you should ensure that your patient is pain-free at all times. Now, morphine, um, it goes both ways. Some patients feel like when you write for them morphine, it's like they're almost at the last stage and that morphine is the next step towards dying, which is not true. Um, morphine is readily available, as Dr. Zipora has said. Um, in fact, just before we came here, I was writing a prescription of morphine and scanning it to the Nairobi Hospital so that a patient can access this treatment. Um, I believe many people don't really know how to prescribe morphine, mm -hmm. and I think we need training uh, for doctors, junior doctors, clinical officers on how to prescribe morphine. Mm -hmm. There are several formulations of morphine, the rapid acting, the ones that act slowly in the background, mm -hmm. and there are ways in which we combine this, we titrate it upwards and downwards so that mm -hmm. the patients get out of pain. Mm -hmm. so, so from, sorry mm -hmm. to cut you short, from a clinical, uh, from a training aspect, have we then integrated this and palliative care into training mm -hmm. so that as you graduate doctors or clinical officers, then they know this? Um, I'm going to say we might have lagged behind slightly on that because morphine, as she's correctly said, is surrounded with a lot of taboo. So even doctors fear to write morphine and they wonder whether if they write it wrongly, whether they'll be called by the pharmacy and poisoned board as to why they've written this wrongly. But I think if the ministry can take up this challenge and just organize quick, short trainings on how to prescribe morphine, you know, the correct way of doing it, putting your full credentials and your registration number so that whoever is dispensing, um, the dispensers fear that somebody could be trying to access the morphine for other purposes. Mm -hmm. So the dispenser needs to be sure that the prescriber is authorized to prescribe this. Mm -hmm. And if everything can even be done in an IT platform so that it's very easy to verify the prescriber, mm -hmm. then a lot more morphine will be getting to our patients. Okay. Can I just add something to that? Yes, um, he's very <coughs> right. Um, what we've done actually uh, um, in terms of advocacy, we managed to put palliative care into the undergraduate medical students' yes, curriculum. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really picked up, but it's already in the curriculum, so that means it has to be taught. We've mm -hmm. actually submitted content, mm -hmm. and we are hoping that it will be, uh, it will be started soon. Okay. Even in the nursing curriculum for, mm -hmm. um, MS, uh, for the bachelor's uh, degree and for the diploma, mm -hmm. we've actually put uh, palliative care into those things. Mm -hmm. One of the things we are doing right now is we are going around the country giving a lot of continuous mm -hmm. medical education mm -hmm. uh, uh, within partnership with the Kenya Medical Associations in different cities okay. to talk about pain assessment and pain management mm -hmm. and we have a project called pain free hostel initiative again supported by the american cancer society we've done it in knh and when we started in knh they were, they were, they were distributing about 30 bottles of morphine per month mm -hmm. by the time we did we were going through each department training um, the knh team mm -hmm. actually it increased to about uh, maybe four times per month okay. so if you actually train people mm -hmm. they will improve we are doing mm -hmm. it in other different hospitals mm -hmm. where we are going into each hostel and taking training into each department in the hospital oh, so okay. training really will improve this situation. Okay. And just to summarize, then we've discussed about palliative care, but where can patients seek these services from? Okay, so the good news is that our government is very supportive of mm -hmm. palliative care, has recognized palliative care as a right in our in the patients' rights charters, has mm -hmm. recognized in the health bill and has put it in all the various documents where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So what we've been work, doing is working on with the government to integrate palliative care into the public health care system. Mm -hmm. So in the referral hospitals, the, the, the tertiary hospital, KNH, Moi, you find mm -hmm. palliative care units mm -hmm. there. We worked, we worked with the former provincial hospitals, they now have mm -hmm. palliative care units, mm -hmm. and we worked with another 
20 county hospitals. So about okay. almost 30 county hospitals in this mm -hmm. country have a team that is providing palliative care. We have mission hospitals that are providing palliative care than the mm -hmm. private institutions. Okay. We need to focus on those ones which have nothing, mm -hmm. they've reached uh, right hard to reach areas. So you okay. can actually receive palliative care in the government hostels next to you or in a hospice where there's a hospice. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much, ladies and okay. gentlemen, for your time this evening. And that's it for today. Uh, next time, tune in for another discussion on health matters. I'm Dr. Masi Korir. Enjoy the rest of your viewing. Sorry.